And I'll disappoint after that. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's Senate occasional lecture. My name is Jackie Morris, and I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure in the Department of the Senate. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and their elders past and present. When we invited today's lecturers in late 2018, the federal election was a distant prospect, so we didn't anticipate that today's theme would be quite so topical. In any event, we're very lucky to have two experts here to talk about electoral campaign financing. Our first speaker is a senior associate in the Grattan Institute's Institutional Reform Program. She's the co-author with Daniel Wood, uh, Danielle Wood of a report that proposes reforms to reduce the influence of money on politics and to promote broader participation in public debate. To summarise the recommendation of who's in the room, access and influence in Australian politics, we have Kate Griffiths in the room today. Our second speaker is a professor at the Melbourne Law School and a director of the Electoral Regulation Research Network. He's published extensively on the regulation of political funding in Australia, um, including on federal legislative changes which took effect last year. Here to discuss how election campaign funding and political lobbying could be further regulated is Professor Ju Chong Tung. Um, he will present second, we'll have Kate kick off, and we um, will hold off questions until they've both completed their talk, so we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, please join me in welcoming Kate to deliver our Senate occasional lecture. <laughs> Thank you, it is a pleasure to be here. So today, I wanna to talk about access and influence, what the data reveals and what it hides about political donations, lobbying, and the revolving door between politicians' offices and lobbying groups. Access and influence are part of daily life here at Parliament House. But for most people, it's a grand mystery. And mystery breeds suspicion, which in turn erodes trust in government parliament and even democracy itself. I'd like to show you a few highlights from a Grattan report last September. The report looks at how special interests with resources and connections can use tools like do donations and lobbying to swing policy in their favour. We were interested in whether Australia has a problem with policy capture. This is when special interests succeed in swaying policy in their own favour at the expense of the public interest. And what we found. Generally, Australia's political institutions are pretty robust. We do have party structures, we do have parliament and media providing checks and balances. But there are certainly examples where bad policy is made or good policy is dropped because powerful interests have too much sway. And we identify a series of risk factors for policy capture that are present in our system. So in the following slides, I'll show you some of these risk factors and what we can do about them. But first, I want to highlight the, the core challenge in this space, and that is that advocacy is part of democracy. We want groups to make representations to government. We want interests to be able to advocate for themselves. This is critical to keeping government itself in check, and it's an important part of building good policy. We need to know who's affected by policy change. Having said that, there is a problem when some interests have a lot more opportunity to influence than others. It shouldn't be about how much money you have or whether you know the right people. But unfortunately, too often it is. So we asked the question, are existing checks and balances sufficient to enable advocacy whilst reducing the risk of undue influence? And spoiler alert, the answer is no. There's real concern about government in general and special interest influence in particular. Trust in government, in, in red here, is at the lowest levels on record. Now, there are lots of things that erode trust, uh, leadership changes, for example. What Grattan looked at uh, in another report was some of the factors behind falling trust. And one of the big ones is growing concern around special interest influence, the one in orange here. More and more people think government is run for a few big interests. 
and at the same time, more and more people are not satisfied with democracy. In a recent survey, Australians nominated undue influence of government through donations and lobbying as their primary concern when it comes to corruption, above fraud, above nepotism, and even dishonesty. This same survey also found that half of people surveyed had personally witnessed or suspected public officials of making decisions that favoured groups that gave political donations or support. And perhaps even more shockingly, the number of people who thought who had experienced this was higher amongst those who worked in government and higher again amongst those that had worked in federal government. So there is real suspicion about special interest influence in Australian politics at the moment. As you would have noticed, this week it was secret meetings with a Chinese donor seeking citizenship. And was it last week or the week before, it was One Nation allegedly soliciting donations from the American gun lobby. Individual cases like these are concerning in their own right, but they also raise the question, how much more do we not know about? And that's where our research comes in. In our research, we identified a range of risk factors for policy capture. These are risk factors, factors that are present in our system. The red highlights the ones that are more of a risk for Australia, the yellow and orange, the ones that are less of a risk. I know you won't be able to see all the detail of this. Don't worry, I'll go through some of it in the following slides. But what I want to highlight here is that there are some factors that are really at play here in Australia. Some of them are things like there is a real incentive to influence because government can determine winners and losers here. There is also um, some of the ability to influence through the reliance of political parties on major donors and through the opportunities for repeated interactions, the opportunity to build relationships. Some of those are real risk factors in the Australian system. But there are other risk factors that are not so present in Australia and I particularly highlight un unchecked discretion is not so much of an issue here as it would be in many countries. So the first risk factor I want to highlight today is that a small number of donors make up a large share of donations. The top 5% of donors contributed more than half of all declared donations at the last election. We have an uncapped system at the federal level, which means that political parties can spend as much as they can raise. And they have a real incentive to raise money. The more they raise, the more they can get their message out, the more likely they are to be elected. So our political parties are heavily reliant on these major donors, the top 5%, say. But the main reason we care about who these donors are is so we can understand whether they have undue influence over policy, whether they're getting special deals and whether it's against the public interest. Now, first of all, we know that money buys access. In Queensland, for example, half of major donors at the last Queensland election got a meeting with one of the top three ministers, that is the Premier, Deputy Premier or Treasurer in the immediate lead up to the election. In New South Wales, the share of major donors that got a meeting with one of those same top three ministers was smaller, it was about a quarter. And there may be a couple of reasons for that, but that's still a pretty high strike rate. It's not a strike rate any of us could expect to achieve. In New South Wales, they do have caps on donations so their major donors, the same number of major donors, make up a smaller share of total donations. So that could be part of the reason why, access, why uh, donations buy less access there. But another part of the reason could simply be that they disclose less information about who ministers meet with than Queensland does. Now we can't do this analysis at the federal level because federal ministers don't publish their diaries. But we still know that money buys access at the federal level because all major parties run fundraising dinners. These are dinners where you pay thousands of dollars for a seat at the table with a politician. So you are paying for access, for the opportunity to bend the ear of a politician. And there is potential there for major donors to exert undue influence, partly because the parties rely on them and partly because they get these privileged opportunities to influence. The next, next risk factor that I would like to highlight is the lack of transparency in the system. There's a lot of party funding we don't know about, and that's the red zone for the two major parties. But this could be a good thing. These are undisclosed funding could be lots of small donations below the threshold for disclosure. Lots of mum and dad donors, lots of sausage sizzles, 
this would be a sign that a lot of the Australian community were actually politically engaged, that's a real positive, and that parties receive funding from a good spread of the community, that would be a real positive. Unfortunately, we can't be reassured that that is good because it could also represent donation splitting, where multiple donations are made under the threshold in order to hide the identity of the donor. And the reason we can't separate those two things is because our donations regulation is weak. In three particular areas, in fact, Australia's threshold is very high internationally. So we don't disclose donations until they reach at least $13,800, and that is a very high threshold. But, you know, that might be acceptable if multiple donations that then reach the $13,800 threshold are then put on the record. And that's the really big loophole that we see in the system. Parties don't have to aggregate donations from the same donor, which means that multiple $10,000 donations that might sum to $100,000 don't need to be on the record, on the party's record. I should clarify that the donors are expected to declare that themselves but there is no way of knowing. And the third factor that makes our donations regulation really weak is that donations disclosures are not timely. Essentially, it can take up to 19 months after a donation is made for the public to find out about it, which means that when voters go to the polls and cast their vote, they don't know who is funding that party's election campaign. So our donations regulation is weak but our lobbying regulation is even weaker. It's a farce. We have a code of conduct for lobbyists and a register for lobbyists, but it only applies to a very narrow group of those who lobby. And the penalty for lobbying unregistered is deregistration. So you can see why that isn't working. Lobbying activity matters arguably even more than donations because it's about who's getting face time, who has the chance to pitch their case, and who are politicians not hearing from. We looked at meetings with senior ministers in New South Wales and Queensland because, again, this is where they publish the information. And some interests have a lot more opportunity to influence than others. Here you'll see that lobbying activity is skewed towards high regulation businesses. These are businesses that have the most to gain or lose from government policy decisions. It's industries like mining, like property development, like transport, where government decisions make a big difference to the bottom line. So it is not at all surprising that these are the groups that are knocking on doors of government. But it does suggest the potential for undue influence when meetings are skewed towards these groups. And when we look at other channels of influence, when we look at donations, and commercial lobbying contacts and meetings with senior ministers together, we see the skew is even stronger. We looked at these multiple influence channels in Queensland because they, the data is available in Queensland for all three of these channels. At the federal level, we see this same skew in donations, but we don't know about the other, the other two. They just don't publish that information. Most worryingly of all here is how poorly represented consumer and community groups are. Ministers may not be hearing all sides of the debate when they're making a decision. And again, it's not that surprising that these groups are underrepresented because it is really difficult for diffuse groups. If you think of consumers and taxpayers, potentially their interests align most closely with the public interest. But they're difficult groups to organise and advocate for. Um, they've got a very small individual incentive uh, to be knocking on doors. It's still a real risk to policy, though, that they're not in the room. Then, when we look by industry, we can get a bit, bit more of a picture of which industries are in the room. And we can see that it is property and construction, mining and energy, transport um, are all in there. Gambling, in particular, I want to highlight in the middle there represents a very low share of the economy, that's the diamond, but a much higher level of lobbying activity across multiple influence channels. The last risk factor I wanna to mention today is relationships and the coziness that can develop between policymakers, politicians and their staff and well-resourced lobby groups. This is because they exchange people, the revolving door. <laughs> 
And what this chart shows is all ministers and assistant ministers who have left politics since the 1990s and where they went after politics. You know, some retired, some went into their own business or a key government role, perhaps an official appointment, but 28% went into roles with special interests. So politicians today are being lobbied by their friends and their former colleagues, potentially people who they want to please or maybe even owe a favour to. When we look at this another way, when we look at those who are registered lobbyists, this is a narrow portion of lobbyists, it's only those that work for a commercial lobbying firm on behalf of a client rather than say a peak body or a union on behalf of their employer. But those lobbyists, more than, more than a third of them are former government officials and that share has been growing. So we can see that the revolving door is a big part of the lobbying landscape and there's three big problems with this in terms of undue influence. The first is that politicians might make decisions while they're in office with a view to a future career and nobody wants that. Politicians and their staff could bring privileged information with them to their new lobbying roles. And whilst that is not allowed, there is no way of, there are no checks and balances on that. And thirdly, policymakers could just be unduly persuaded or give too much time to their friends over other groups. And we all know the bubble effect. This appears to be a real risk here. So what we recommend, what can we actually do about this? Our report recommended eight changes to the current system, and they're focused on improving transparency, accountability, and the opportunity for a broader range of voices to have a say in policy debates. I'm gonna give you a quick run through of these now, but I'm happy to talk about any of them in more detail later. So first of all, to improve transparency in lobbying, we recommend publishing who ministers meet with. We recommend publishing the names of lobbyists or organisations with behind the scenes access to Parliament House. These are the people who lobby regularly as part of their main job. They might be representing a peak body or a union, not just the commercial lobbyists that are currently required to register. And that matters because by registering, they have to abide by the lobbying code of conduct, which they should be doing. We also recommend fixing loopholes in the donations disclosures. Much as I said before, we really need to lower that threshold. We need to fix the aggregation problem. It's such an obvious loophole. It was never intended to be that way. It needs to be fixed. And we also need to publish more timely donations information so that people have that information when they cast their vote. To strengthen accountability, we recommend a code of conduct for all parliamentarians. And it's kind of amazing that we don't have one. All state parliamentarians have them. Ministers do have them. Certainly the public service has a code of conduct, and yet uh, we don't have one for all parliamentarians, one that, captures, that covers backbenchers and opposition and crossbenchers. And we need something like that to clarify rules around accepting gifts, around corporate hospitality that sort of land an individual in hot water every so often, but we don't actually have a standard that the public media and parliament itself can hold elected officials to. So we need a code of conduct, and that code of conduct the one for the lobbyists, the one for the politicians, should be independently administered. It's not okay that the Prime Minister's office or the Attorney General's office has to make a decision about whether or not there was a breach. That should be done independently and reported back to Parliament. It shouldn't be a political thing. And we support a Commonwealth Integrity Commission for serious risks, serious corruption cases. Then, Finally, we also recommend some ways to what we call level the playing field. And this part is by far the toughest part. We should be actively seeking out underrepresented groups in policy review processes when we're talking about major policy changes. This is something the Productivity Commission does do in its reviews and it's something we could use, those um, methods we could use more broadly when we're talking about big policy changes because we know some groups are not in the room so we need to correct for that. Then probably our biggest recommendation here is, is to cap political advertising spend during election campaigns. And there are two reasons why we would do that. The first is to reduce the arms race between political parties for more and more donations. If there is a limit on how much a party can spend during election campaigns, then you don't have the incentive to keep chasing the dollar, the, the extra dollar, 
and each individual donor becomes a lot less powerful. But there's a second benefit to this sort of reform. If you cap what political parties can spend in election campaigns, you also need to cap what third parties can spend. And some third parties have a lot more resources to communicate in the lead up to an election than others do. So it puts a limit on that. It says there is an imbalance here and we are going to prevent that imbalance from going too far. I want to finish by saying that most comparable countries have stronger integrity regimes than our federal system does. All Australian states and territories have stronger regimes than our federal system does. And what I've spoken about today are relatively low cost reforms. They're really popular, they're practical, they just require some leadership. Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet um, and their elders past and present. And uh, it is a wonderful privilege to be able to give uh, this lecture. So thank you so much to uh, Jackie, to Tony, and to Philia. Um, uh, you know, I was walking up here, just uh, uh, got a taxi to drop me off, rather than underground, uh, a bit further away, and just walking up to the building and realizing the majesty of this building and how it, it should throb as the sort of beating heart of Australian democracy. So thank you very much. There is a deep paradox at the heart of representative democracy. It is a form of rule by the people which distances itself from the people. Now, the central justification of representative democracy is popular sovereignty. As the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, proclaims, the will of the people shall be the authority of government. Yet, as representative and not direct democracy, there's a structured distance between those who govern and the people. Now, the aspiration of representative democracy is, of course, that this distance be bridged by strong mechanisms of, of accountability and responsiveness and an ethos based on public interest, all of which is to ensure that public officials rule for the people. The obvious risk, of course, is that the distance becomes a gulf, that public officials, rather than governing for the people, govern for the few that an oligarchy operates rather than a democracy. Now, it's a startling fact that many Australians, and increasingly so, believe that government functions as an oligarchy. Survey evidence from the Australian election study, and some of which you've seen in Kate's presentation, shows that perceptions that people in government look after themselves, and secondly, governments run for a few big interests, have risen significantly since the 2000s. So much so that in 2016, more than 70% of respondents agreed with the first statement, people in government look after themselves, and more than half with the second, government is run for few big interests. Now, when it comes to economies which are organized according to capitalist principles, the risk of oligarchy takes on a particular complexion. And here we come squarely to the problems of money in politics. Now, decades ago, Albert Einstein insightfully observed that under capitalism, what he considered to be the predatory phase of human development, members of legislature are selected by political parties, largely financed or in otherwise influenced by private capitalists, who for all practical purposes separate the legislature from the electorate. And it's not only direct contributions to political parties that secure the power of business, but it's also significantly their ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. It is this ownership, private property rights, that gives rise to what Charles Lindblom, in his classic study, Politics and Markets, 
describes as the privileged position of business. This privileged position implies tremendous power in the market and in the political sphere. Businesses have power in the political sphere because political representatives rely heavily on the decision of businesses for their electoral success. And as Lindblom has observed, businessmen cannot be left knocking at the doors of the political systems. They must be invited in. The particular risk of oligarchy in capitalist economies is that of plutocracy. Now, democracies are not defenseless against such risks. Even barring fundamentally organizing society, democracies have a range of tools to insulate the political process from plutocratic or more broadly oligarchical control. It is, however, a fact bordering upon scandalous that the political elite at the federal level have not only failed to address the corrupting risks of money in politics, being content with laissez-faire regulation that Kate has so ably uh, described, but also through their practices and actions fueled plutocracy. It is not surprising then that the main problem of corruption perceived by Australian citizens is undue influence of government through bribery, political contributions, lobbying and business. There are three notable vices here that infect both the funding of election campaigns as well as lobbying, secrecy, corruption and unfairness. These are problems I've detailed in my book, Money and Politics, The Democracy We Can't Afford, and it's been recently mapped out in the superb, superb uh, Grattan Institute report written by Kate and her colleagues, uh, Danielle Wood and Cam Camilla Shivers. So like former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, I believe we need root and branch reform of the regulation of money in Australian politics. And the Grattan Institute report provides, uh, as Kate's presentation showed, very significant recommendations. And in an article just published, I've proposed two 10-point plans, uh, which you see up on the slide and the handouts, I think, circulating. One for the democratic regulation of the funding of election campaigns, and another for the democratic regulation of political lobbying. In this lecture, however, I'd like to take a different tack. What I'd like to focus on are the risks of the regulation of money in politics, or perhaps more specifically, of the risks of the growing push to regulate. And the underlying danger of all these risks that I'll be talking about, and there are six, is that regulation will be promulgated, which leaves the oligarchical tendencies of our system intact, or worse, exacerbates them. Now, the first risk eventuated with the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act 2018. Legislation was passed last year, which has been characterized by the Australian Electoral Commission as the most significant change to funding and disclosure legislation in some time. One of the key aims of that legislation was to deal with interference in Australian politics by foreign governments, specifically interference by the Chinese Communist Party government. But consider this. The ban on foreign donors found in that legislation would not have stopped contributions that had been made by the two businessmen at the center of this controversy, Chao Chak Wing and Huang Xiang Mo. Nor, I should have added, would it have prohibited the tens of thousands of dollars paid by Huang to former Liberal Minister Santos Santoro for access to Peter Dutton when he was Immigration Minister. Why is this the case? Chao Chak Wing is an Australian citizen. And Huang Xiang Mo, when he made these contributions, uh, was a permanent resident. And the ban on foreign donor, very rightly so, does not extend to foreign-born Australian citizens and permanent residents. And at the same time, there's a chance that this ban on foreign donors gives rise to a taint on political participation by foreign-born Australians, particularly those of Chinese ethnicity. So the first risk then is one of selective symbolism. The second risk is the fetishizing of disclosure. Now, to be clear, there are serious and if not fatal deficiencies to the disclosure scheme at the federal level, as Kate's presentation has shown. For my part, I would like to describe it more as a non-disclosure scheme. 
I'm therefore strongly supportive of measures that strengthen the federal disclosure obligations. At the same time, we should be acutely conscious of the limitations of disclosure. First, disclosure, even when provided in real time, does not necessarily bring about transparency. For this to occur, you need, at the very least, accessible and meaningful data and vigilant media and civil society organizations. And second, transparency does not necessarily improve the integrity of the political process. Take, for example, the sale of access and influence by the major parties, and Kate has referred to this. Such peddling of influence has been known for a long time, and yet they persist simply because they have been normalized by the major parties. A recent example, for exa a recent for example is last month's fundraisers by both the Federal Australian Labour Party and the Liberal Party at the mansion of Australia's richest individual, Anthony Pratt, where the entrance fee to rub shoulders with ministers and shadow ministers ran into thousands of dollars. For the Federal Labour Party and the Federal Liberal Party, these practices are, in the words of former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, time honoured. We can see how Louis Brandis' quip that sunlight is the best disinfectant can mislead. Unlike sunlight, disclosure does not naturally prevent or remedy the corrupting effects of political money. For this to occur, there needs to be effective institutional mechanisms combined with consistent and determined scrutiny. The third risk stems from the fact that most controversy concerning money in Australian politics relates to private funding. Now, this can then lead to the impression that private funding is problematic and public funding, on the other hand, is purifying. It then might be a very easy step to advocate, as Mike Baird did when uh, Premier of New South Wales, total public funding of election campaigns, a system which implies a complete ban on private funding. Now, putting aside constitutional difficulties, which in my mind are insurmountable, such valorization of public funding neglects the role of private funding as a form of political participation. And that in small amounts, private funding is a democratic form of participation. Election campaigns funded by big money in small sums would testify to a vibrant democracy. Now, such valorization equally neglects the dangers of public funding. One source of these dangers is captured by the influential cartel theses uh, advanced by political scientists Richard Cass and Peter Mayer. At the core of the thesis is a contention that major parties act together to prevent or at least lessen the threat of competition from other parties. And according to this thesis, one of the principal ways this occurs is through a public funding system bias in the favour of major parties. So that brings us to our fourth risk, the risk of fueling unfairness. Or perhaps to put it more bluntly, the danger of reinforcing oligarchy by entrenching the dominance of the major parties. As with private funding, there's nothing necessarily virtuous or corrupting about public funding. If anything, the recent government, government advertising blitz shows how the abuse of public funds can undermine the integrity of elections. What is crucial with public funding is how it is being channeled into the political system. And with the public funding of political parties, the issue of central importance is the criteria for providing such funding. Now, this is, of course, a realm where all formulas are imperfect. At the same time, there are criteria which tend more to unfairness such as formulas based on the number of parliamentary representatives where parties with significant electoral support but with no or little parliament, uh, parliamentary representation are disadvantaged, or formulas which fail to put in place measures that offset the competitive dominance of the major parties. As an alternative, I've proposed, and it's included in ten point, one of the 10-point plans, a scheme of election funding payments based on the number of first preference votes and a tapered scheme scale, as well as a party development fund to provide startup funds for new parties. <laughs> 
The fifth risk is that the growing push to regulate focuses only on the funding of election campaigns, but fails to address the problems posed by lobbying. As Kate's report makes clear, and in her presentation too, political lobbying is invariably funded political activity. And political lobbying and political contributions are often deployed as different strategies directed at the same goal of influencing the political process. And that is why you see up in the slide, there are two 10-point plans, one on the funding of federal election campaigns and the other on political lobbying. And we can see, closely, we can see clearly in the context of a cl climate emergency, in the context of a climate emergency, the close connection between political contributions, spending, and lobbying by reference to the strategies of the fossil fuel industry. What has been variously described as the fossil fuel order or the fossil fuel power network. These companies are amongst the largest contributors to the major parties. The success or the $22 million advertising campaign by the mining companies against, against the Rudd government's resource super profits tax is now very much part of political folklore. So much so, it's now become routine for industry groups to threaten a mining textile campaign every time they don't get their way with government. And Kate's taken us through the uh, quite frightening data about the revolving door or more the uh, golden uh, elevator. Ponder this. The employees and the lobbyists of the fossil fuel industry have included former Labour ministers Nick Bocas, Greg Combe, Craig Emerson, Martin Ferguson. Former National Party leaders John Anderson and Mark Vale. And former Liberal Party ministers Helen Coonan and Ian McFarlane. And under the Howard government, climate change policy was determined by fossil fuel lobbyists, many of whom were former senior public servants, who likened themselves to organised crime through a self-styled label. Greenhouse Mafia. Let me stress, this was a self-ascribed label. The use of money has clearly contributed to the formidable power of the fossil fuel industry. And if you think my talk of oligarchy is shrill or excessive, then consider this. The fossil fuel industry has played an instrumental role in ousting two out of the five prime ministers we've had since 2007. Kevin Rudd in 2010 and Malcolm Turnbull last year. Let me come to the final risk. Several years ago, I heard an expert on international political finance observe that big money in politics is politics for men. Now, this was firstly a source of acute embarrassment for me. Uh, it was an embarrassment because I had not systematically considered the question of gender in my work on political funding. And indeed, the scholarship in this area tends to neglect the question of gender. More importantly, the the, uh, this observation was a revelation. As it became clear to me that the fault lines of unfairness stemming from money in politics doesn't just run in relation to political parties or more broadly political organizations, it doesn't just run in relation to the wealthy and the less well-off, but it also runs amongst men and women in politics. And the connection between plutocratic financing politics and patriarchy is not too difficult to understand. The essential problem is that women tend to have less access than men to resources required for meaningful participation in the political process. Now, this can result from limited access to funding networks, especially those dominated by boys' clubs. And the personal also has significant political implications. With mothers in this country still shouldering most parenting responsibilities, labour market participation of women tend to be more broken than men, resulting in less independent wealth. The financial costs of political participation can also be higher with the additional need for funds to cover their caring responsibilities. For instance, money for childcare when you go campaigning. And all these disadvantages become more acute the higher the costs 
of seeking pre-selection, the higher the cost of election campaigns. So now there's furious agreement amongst major parties that there's a women problem in politics. Let us foreground how democratizing money in politics can also advance the cause of gender equality. And alongside uniform measures that will advance such equality, such as spending limits, as uh, recommended by the Greta Institute report, we should also be considering targeted measures such as public funding for gender equality initiatives, including financial incentives to increase the number of women in senior party official roles and as elected representatives. Let me conclude. In my mind, there are six key risks of the growing push to regulate money in politics. Selective symbolism, the fetishizing of disclosure, the valorizing of public funding, unfairness being viewed, lobbying being left out, and the question of gender being ignored. Risks are most clearly not inevitabilities. With keen awareness, deft judgment, and determination, all these risks can be ameliorated if not avoided. And in this way, we can pay for democratic, and I stress democratic, regulation of money in politics and hold at bay the danger of oligarchy. In this way, we come closer then to what was proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that the will of the people shall be the basis of authority in government. Thank you. About 10 minutes, if there are any questions, I'm sure there will be a few from the floor. Um, we've got microphones in the middle of the room, if you've managed to come to them. Would you mind going to the microphone, so, just so that we've got a few people in the gallery, it'd be easier for them to hear. Presentations. Uh, I'm struck that uh, when you talk about uh, influence and lobbying, it's primarily in your presentations been in the context of lobbying of the executive and you haven't really talked so much about lobbying of individual members of parliament, which at one level would seem to be a more delicate um, area in which to try to draw lines because it's the function of members of parliament to take opinions from the community and transfer them up the line towards the executive. But at the same time, we have seen cases where uh, uh, particular groups of MPs who may be geographically linked to particular industries can exercise tremendous political influence, not just through their own um, sort of transferred lobbying within their parties, but also to the extent of forming a potentially hostile block within the party caucuses who can really threaten uh, the interests of the members of the executive. So how do we fit MPs and senators into this framework? Yeah, good question, thank you. I'm not sure if this one's on. Yes, it is. Excellent. Uh, so a couple of thoughts on that. Great question. First of all, two of our recommendations were aimed at trying to get better visibility of exactly that. Publishing ministers' diaries would tell us something about who is actually getting access and would open that to scrutiny, the opportunity to sort of raise that maybe somebody else should have been consulted on this particular issue. Uh, also, the, the um, incentive that provides for a minister and their office to think carefully about who they are um, consulting with and making time for. I suspect um, Dutton might not have had that lunch if his diary was on the record. The other recommendation we looked at, because of course that's only ministers, that doesn't cover opposition, that doesn't cover backbenchers, it might not cover many of the sorts of um, the individuals who, um, for minor parties, who are often funded almost exclusively by um, a few interests. So Bob Catter's funding, for example, is almost entirely from um, uh, pro-gun lobby groups. Some of those groups might be better um, represented or, or at least uh, might be on the record a bit better through um, this um, broadening of the lobbyist register to include those who have regular access to politicians here at Parliament House. Um, so it's not a perfect measure of everyone who's lobbying or all access to politicians, but there are, well, we, we know um, from last year, there are 1,700 
and 55 people who have a behind the scenes lobbyist pass or orange pass to Parliament House. Uh, but we don't know who they are. We don't know who um, which organisations have those sorts of passes. I can tell you Grattan has one. Uh, so we are there trying to influence and we should be on the public record <laughs> illustrating that. Uh, who else is also trying to influence? Um, so I think that would get at some of the behind the scenes access, some of the um, conversations that happen here in the corridors of parliament and some of the opportuni opportunistic lobbying that can happen because of that directly with senior decision makers who of course are the ones that have the most discretionary power in the system. Oh, I barely to add to Kate, I, I think I pretty much agree. I think uh, I suppose the, the focus on Mr. Dari's really reflects what is uh, the centralization power of the executive in this country. So it's really about attaching regulation to where power lies. Um, and I think that a quick point I'll make, I think just really just consistent with what Kate is saying, is that where the meetings with the MPs will be captured in the register of lobbyists. So in my 10 point plan is that uh, uh, those are so-called repeat players will be captured and not just commercial lobbies as is currently the case, but also in-house lobbies. And what that would include is also disclosure of their lobbying activity. And that would include um, meetings with members of parliament. I'll just add also on that. Um, one of the real challenges in this space is um, coming back to an earlier point I made about the penalties for not being registered um, as a lobbyist are to be deregistered as a lobbyist. So um, how you actually um, regulate and encourage people to put, the, put their names on the record, I'm advocating um, for these interests and here's a variety of other people who are advocating for these interests. Um, is really critical. And the, one of the reasons we suggest linking the lobbyist register to the passes of Parliament House is that that is actually a privilege that can be taken away if people are not abiding by the lobbying co um, code of conduct. So um, that was actually an idea put forward by Jackie Lambie's team a little while back um, before she um, lost her seat. So the, you know, it, one of the real challenges here is actually um, finding a way to um, regulate it and encourage people to, to own up, to be on the record um, f in terms of their activity. A further question? The first one was a good one. That's always a bit uh, intimidating to follow. <laughs> yes. I'm not quite sure whether or not this is going from a different direction or whether it's not related, but just recently, the whole issue of governments giving grants to organisations but then telling them as part of the contract that they could not use the money for lobbying. Mm. And I think this is something that affects organisations like environmental groups, charitable organisations, so this muffles them if they want to be able to tell governments that their policy is not actually moving in the right direction. It stifles their independence and their freedom. Now, <clears throat> is that something that fits into these columns, figures, points? Did you want to go first to Tom? Yes, I'm just trying to, or maybe Kate can go. For, I'm trying to grab my 10 point plan, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, here it is, yeah. Okay, yes, I've got, I've, I've, Kate, do you want to go? Yeah. All I'll say on this actually is just that, um, so one of the challenges for groups that are fully government funded is, would be that if their grants are, are linked and that's their only source of funds. Another challenge is some of these groups are, are quite small and it's difficult to distinguish their funding sources sufficiently to isolate this pool of funds is for advocacy. Um, and then um, another challenge is even determining whether um, something counts as advocacy or lobbying in the first place um, and I think that's a much broader challenge. Um, how much lobbying counts as lobbying? We all advocate for our own interests um, and you don't want a system that's trying to regulate every person, but you do need to draw a line somewhere. So mm. that'd be my observations. Mm. I think you raise a very important issue. I think the question about censorship of society organisations, whether it be explicitly in terms of contractual arrangements or even more insidiously their own self-censorship through the receipt of government funding, I think it's a very serious issue for this country. Um, for my part, I think, and you see this clearly with uh, point eight of the 10-point um, the plan on lobbying, is that, uh, and perhaps it's treading through the presentation, we need countervailing measures 
to the tendencies towards oligarchy, towards the centralization of power. And part of countervailing measures is that you need to resource disadvantaged groups to actually engage in advocacy and in lobbying. And to do so in a way that ensures that, um, what it, that they're acting independently and not uh, tailing the message but by virtue of the fact they're receiving government funding and sometimes quite substantial government funding. So that's that with uh, point eight. Yeah. We've got time for one more, yes? One of the suggestions, if I understood it correctly, was that there should be restrictions on advertising by third parties. And I'd be grateful if you could elaborate how that might work. Uh, let me give you a hypothetical example. Let us say a party proposed a massive increase in company tax. You might then find 50 or 100 public companies each wanting to campaign against that. And one can think of many other examples where there are proposals which would affect a large section of the population or the economy. How would you restrict the advertising by each of the organisations affected by such a proposal? It's a really good question, thank you. Uh, the proposal would be that, first of all, you have to regulate the third parties if you're going to regulate the political parties because the political parties are the primary contenders in the election and if they are drowned out by third party groups you potentially have a bit of an issue there. You also have a problem of third party actors acting for political parties as we know the unions do for the ALP for example. So the, you have to regulate the third parties. Research would suggest that it's best practice to give political parties a higher threshold um, than third parties, but for third parties to be regulated um, sort of individually, so in each individual company would have its own um, threshold, except when they act in concert. And I hope that Ju Chong can give us a better uh, description of exactly how that works under the law, but uh, the gist of it would be that somebody would have to make a decision about whether groups are acting in concert or are each campaigning fairly for their own perspective on that same issue. Uh, as far as um, I think it's been tested in the courts in New South Wales with unions um, jointly campaigning there, because New South Wales does have um, a cap on spending during election campaigns. Uh, I guess the other um, point to make would just be that there's actually very few third party groups who would be affected by a cap. And that's um, something that we can see um, from admittedly imperfect, but um, some data on um, political campaigning expenditure by third parties. So that's on the record, even though parties isn't, like parties campaigning expenditure isn't. But um, third parties, there are lots of groups that spend something on political campaigning, uh, very few groups that spend a lot on it. In fact, there's kind of, uh, we looked at um, data from uh, two years ago and there were, in, or actually we looked at multiple years and in any given year, there are between five and eight groups that spend more than a million dollars in in campaigning. And the sorts of caps that would be plausible for third parties would be in that order. So there would be very few individual groups affected, but those individual groups are things like, are groups like unions, Get Up, uh, the Minerals Council, those groups might be limited by a cap. She's covered it so well. I mean, that's right. Uh, the, only, the only thing I would add, and it's actually not my 10-point plan, but it's in my book, is that uh, I advocate um, stronger internal accountability mechanisms for spending on the part of companies and unions. So with companies, for example, and you see this, you know, as a, uh, the United Kingdom has this, where you need shareholder authorization uh, to actually spend, uh, spend, uh, spend uh, in a political way above a certain amount. Um, and I would advocate the same in terms of unions actually requiring some kind of member authorization for spending. Mm. Right. Well, thank you. It's been very interesting. I think we can all hear the depth of the thinking and the research that you've both done in this area. Um, would you join me in thanking <laughs> Ju Chong, Tom, and Kate Griffiths? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're about to be mom, so <laughs> <laughs> prepare to.